feel that I need to move these, even if I shouldn't really, because everybody else has done. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for uh, having me speak at this conference. You'll see from the first slide that it's a, a, essentially a joint presentation uh, by myself and my good friend and colleague, Professor Nick Frost. Nick is on holiday this week, and he sent me an encouraging email from uh, a pool, said, I bet I'm more chilled than you are. I'm going to take that as encouragement. I'm passionate about family support, and I want to start by saying that it's okay to be ideological and a bit dewy-eyed about family support. If we do it right, we revolutionise for the better the lives of children and young people. And so when I speak, and I'll speak about all sorts of uh, different topics which I'll go into in a few moments, please hear and, 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 and share that belief that we can make a difference. And as we all battle with our, our jobs and bureaucracy and cuts and struggles and disappointments and things going wrong, it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that there is strong, compelling evidence that family support, working with families, engaging with children, makes a difference to them for the better. And I guess that uh, I wanted to start there because it's so important, and this conference is so important, as we allow ourselves the privilege of time to think about what we do next uh, with our families. I want to argue that we're going to, we, we need to defend it, and indeed we need to develop it, even though we are in times of financial difficulty, if not austerity. I want to start by thinking about what we mean by family support and some of the challenges that we're facing at the moment. I'm going to argue that there is compelling evidence that it's good value for money, that you can argue it from an economic perspective. And then I want to just spend a few moments thinking about some comments that have been made. Nick and I did some work with two groups of family support workers in two different large cities in the north of England. And I'll just show you some of the slides and the comment, on, on a couple of slides, some of the comments that they made. And then I want to talk about Leeds for a moment. I'm uh, proud of being from Leeds, and I want us to describe three uh, aspects of what we do and how we're moving as we disproportionately invest by choice in family support services. So what do we mean by family support? What do we, what do we understand by family support? Uh, it's been described as a slippery concept, which means that in one sense you can call it what you want and define of it what you want, but let me try. It's based on the idea that most families, at times, will struggle. Some will have struggles that they can easily uh, overcome, and some will have struggles that they need help with. But the idea that families are easy uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a myth and a nonsense. I have three children who are reaching their adulthood and I'm enormously relieved. <laughs> but over the years, and they know I do this, I've talked about them and, uh, and what they do, but over the years, they have presented all sorts of marvellous research data for me. <laughs> How old should you be before you have your ears pierced? <laughs> when can you go into town on the bus on your own? What happens when your child, who is not 18, comes home clearly having purchased alcohol and not just purchased it, but drunk it in enthusiastic quantities. <laughs> that was just last week. That was... <laughs> but what, those struggles are genuine. Those, I don't know where the answers to those questions are. And yet, we, 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 we have a rhetoric which says families should resolve their own difficulties. Sometimes families need help. Family support responds 
and is best responsive when it focuses on the expressed need of families and children. And so partnership is absolutely critical. The partnership between those of us who want to work in family support and the families is really important. We have to hear their voice. We have to understand and hear the expressed needs of the children and the families that we want to work with. And it works best when it is started when the problem is quite small or new. But that doesn't mean that family support is just about young children. Family support is really important where there are adolescents in the family as well. We need to believe and have faith in the fact that families can change, that things can be different, that choices, poor choices, can be rectified. And if I just make a, a clamber onto another of my soapboxes, children remain children even if they've committed serious criminal offences. And children can remain children and can change and can find themselves in different circumstances, even if they've made really poor choices. And just because we find ourselves with challenging teenagers doesn't mean that we should look puzzled and not offer the support that we can. And of course, the use of the extended family to offer help, encouragement and support is really important. Families don't live in total isolation. We can talk about uh, uh, social mobility, we can talk about the fact that families sometimes are isolated, but we can also talk about where is the social capital within that family. Family support attempts to prevent the development of an emerging problem. We need to, say, to, to identify the difficulty and address that at its root cause. To do our best effort, and make our best effort I should say, to prevent that becoming a lifelong difficulty and a life-changing difficulty for the children, the young people, and their families. And there's a focus here, a key focus, which is that we're working to improve the life and the well-being of children and young people. And again, it's really important that we don't lose sight of that key focus. If we can change the lives of young people, our lives are improved, our communities are improved, our cities, our towns, our villages are improved. There's a core belief based on change theory that ch families can change, and as has been said already this morning, a core belief that most families want the best for their children. Very, very few parents wake up in the morning not wanting the best for their children. Just because their children don't always get the best doesn't mean that they are, we have hordes of people who have malevolent thoughts towards children. Now clearly there are those who do and we need to address that and, uh, in, in different ways. But most parents want the best for the next generation. And family support can change wider social contexts. The Director of Children's Services in Leeds, Nigel Richardson, uh, uses uh, this phrase, children live in families, families make communities, and communities make cities. If we can change the way that children experience their adolescence and their childhood, we can change our cities. Furthermore, benefits can, uh, of, of using family support can have real economic uh, um, um, 
uh, outcomes and, and benefits. Saving in public expenditure. If you work, if family support works well, if it changes the lives and the experience of those families, fewer children find themselves looked after or in care. And a reduction in social problems and the, uh, the attendant uh, disproportionate, I would want to argue, focus on antisocial behaviour, whatever that is. We can't do that today, but whatever that is, and how we uh, address uh, some people would call antisocial behaviour and some of us might want to call it normal adolescent development. <laughs> but there are challenges. There are challenges, and the first challenge in, in our current economic situation, in austerity and re recession, is that family support, and I've mentioned there the third sector quite deliberately, I'll come on to talking more about the, the voluntary sector, the third sector, the faith sector in a moment, is seen as a soft target. It's, we, we, family support is seen as something that can easily be cut, reduced, slimmed down. Somebody called it fluffy. That's a real shame. And we have to push back on that. We have to push back ideologically. We have to push back because there are compelling economic arguments. Family support is seen as not hard-edged enough. And it's an easy target for cuts. A little bit like training or staff development. As if not training and developing our staff teams uh, is something that we can get rid of because we can't afford it. There's a question to be posed about whether family support is becoming disjointed again from traditional social work roles. And it's being pushed in England uh, towards um, education and other settings. Early intervention is being used as a phrase and as a concept which is being used to challenge family support. Short-term, time-limited. Some families need more than short-term, time-limited. You can't change the life of a complex family situation in 12 weeks. You can do some really important stuff in 12 weeks, and for some people that's all that they need. But we mustn't lose sight of the long-term goal. It should be a both-and rather than an either-or. The evidence, well, I'm going to uh, come back to uh, one of the best-known pieces of evidence, the Perry Highscope uh, study, the, the 40th birthday follow-up. Uh, One dollar invested saves $12.90 in terms of the investment group. For those of you, if you haven't heard of this, 123 children born between 1962 and 1967 uh, were split into two cohorts. One cohort was given high quality preschool and one did not. The outcomes are astonishing. And the outcomes over the longitudinal study are astonishing. You can read those bullet points for yourself, but the figures just clearly demonstrate the value of family support, early intervention, whatever you want to describe it as. I'll just leave that there for a moment. A different study, the, uh, the, the Local Authority Research Consortium, uh, study four, uh, has found very similar results. The focus on this study were, were parenting strategies, engagement in education, emotional health and resilience, positive activities and physical health. But one of the important findings is that lead professionals helped families manage their situations. People going in didn't do it to them, but did it with families 
to help them find their own solution, their own outcomes, if you like. And using a complex, and I won't pretend that I fully understand it, but a complex futures uh, methodology which tries to model the outcomes and the potential outcomes of had you not done something, the cost savings are astonishing. There's a wide variation between £400 and £420,000, and that depends on whether the problem was about just uh, placing, finding some simple solutions or whether a child would have spent the rest of their life in a terribly expensive residential, maybe secure, environment. Uh, the CAF, the Common Assessment Framework, an assessment tool, uh, costs... And then the intervention, having done the Common Assessment Framework, which is a, a nationally understood framework in, in, in the UK, uh, those costs were between about 1,500 and about 27,000, again, depending on the complexity of the case. But the potential savings in one case, in one family, are huge. Now, the difficulty is that these are, these are savings into the future. This isn't today's savings. And so when we have a time of austerity, a time of cuts, it's very easy to say, yeah, well, that's all very well, but that will happen in due course. We need the savings now. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that if we work and, and, and deliver high-quality family support in the most difficult, troubled families, the outcomes into the future are really very valuable, both in terms of social capital, but in terms of uh, financial savings as well. Okay, so, so what do the, what the family support workers say? We had uh, uh, the opportunity to speak to a couple of hundred family support workers uh, across two different cities, and the findings were phenomenally similar. And probably, as I uh, read them and as you look at them, none of them will be surprising. <laughs> They say we need effective information and rigorous information sharing processes with agreed protocols with all agencies. Why is it that we can't get information sharing right? We need to ask ourselves if we know, if we know that when we share information, families have better experiences, why is it that we can't get it right? And I don't want to uh, spend hours and hours debating the law. I'm sure we can do that on a, on a separate occasion, or you can call me over coffee to argue that. But there must be a solution. We can't leave it that, that families suffer because we can't talk to each other. We need to change the stigma of family support, perceived as needing help to a more encouraging reassuring method of support and help. We need to articulate what we're, what we're offering better. We need to say that this is not, you are not a problem family, but you are a family who we know are having problems. This is not something that, that we, are, we are saying there's a pejorative uh, uh, discourse here. We're saying that families do struggle. And we're here, and we're wanting to be here to offer support and advice. There's a very clear message that staff in family support services are not given the level of training and the quality of training that social care, social work, frontline social work staff are receiving. We need to address that. A lack of resources in real deprived areas with highly complex family problems. And the complex bit is something which comes back. We're being told, and we know this, that families don't have a single problem. They're complex organisations. And we need to acknowledge that they're complex, and we need to wrap around our work and use as many people as we can, and the skills of as many people as we can. And then something about assessment, too many hoops to jump through around assessment. Why can't assessments just be simple? We have an unerring ability to make simple things complex. And somewhere we need to break that. 
Somewhere we need to say, here is a simply defined, articulated problem. What can we do about it? Rather than make it so complicated that we pretend, or perhaps we even do, not really understand what we're talking about anymore. In terms of facilitators, what would make things better? Well, in one sense, we've asked the wrong question, and uh, methodologically you can criticise us. It's just the opposite, really. Clear sharing into shared interagency policy, parenting and family support offered uh, to all new parents as a universal offer. Isn't that an interesting notion? When you have a child, a universal benefit, if we dare talk about such thing, would be the opportunity for parenting classes. And just to go back to my personal uh, experience, I remember coming home with our, our daughter, our second child, and sitting there with a two-year-old uh, trying to, as two-year-olds do, hug uh, Lizzie, who was a, a few days old, in a way that probably would have severed her head had I not intervened. He was being enormously loving, but not very gentle. And sitting there thinking, I don't know how to do this again. This is really hard. Should family and parenting classes or support be a universal offer? High quality training, closer working partnerships, particularly with voluntary and third sector organisations, and a clear process of assessment that doesn't complicate the case more than it need be. So what next? <coughs> we need a skilled workforce. Workforce development, given my job title, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think it's true. Workforce development is essential. We need to get that right, and we need to make that offer clear. We need to get multi-agency working right. Again, nobody would argue that it's a bad thing to work collaboratively. And yet, we so often break down because we don't talk well to each other and we don't trust each other. And I would argue that as times are getting hard, as cuts are being made, as services are shrinking, all that development work and multi-agency work that was going on is shrinking back. And we're moving back into silos. We're moving back into our own areas of expertise and defending territory, which is terrifically disappointing, particularly for the families that we're working with. We need to recognise that engagement with families is skilled work. One of the things that I'm fascinated by, and I'd welcome any help I can have on this, is getting the first knock on somebody's front door right. I'm a social worker by background, and I still remember the fear. And let's acknowledge fear. Let's be honest, sometimes it's scary. I'm a fairly big bloke, you can tell that, but I get scared as well. They used to call me down when someone violent was coming into the office saying, Andy, would you, would you come down and see so-and-so? And I'd say, why me? And they'd say, because well, you're big. And I said, well, if he hits me, it'll really, really hurt. <laughs> Can't somebody else go? But it's scary. How do you get that front door, that knock, right? What do you say? How do you introduce yourself? How do you articulate the difficulty? We need to do some work on that, and we need to help people develop those skills. We must include children and young people and their views. We must hear about what they think about their families, about their communities, about their schools, about their experience of health care, about what happens when they go and see the doctor, about what happens when they go and say to their teacher, I don't understand, about what they say and what is said to them by a social worker, a family support worker, a police officer, a youth worker who engages with them. 
And very often, our partners in the third sector and the faith sector have access to families that we don't as statutory agencies. I say we, I'm sorry, as I don't as a statutory agency. I'm sure there are people from the third sector and the faith sector here today. How do we work in partnership with them? And how do we work together to gain access to those wonderful group of people called hard to reach? I remember having a wonderful argument and discussion with uh, a manager some years ago who said, why haven't you accessed all those hard to reach families? <laughs> so I explained that they were hard to reach. <laughs> it got a bit sticky after that, but we, uh, we got out the other end. Now, let me tell you about some things that we're doing in Leeds. These are hardly revolutionary things, but we're very proud of them. You'll see on, uh, on, the, on the slide at the top uh, corner there, and I've got my badge on, I'm very corporate today, child-friendly Leeds. We are child-friendly Leeds. We have an aspiration to be child-friendly. It's developed out of the work uh, by UNICEF, but it's, uh, we, we, we're looking to develop that notion of child-friendliness. This is not just about children's rights. And I don't want for one moment to pretend that children's rights don't, meet, don't matter. But it's more than that. Because the children's rights doesn't, for instance, embrace free swimming opportunities at the local authority pools. Friendly bus drivers. Kind shopkeepers. Welcoming civic spaces. I've uh, got a personal mission that I haven't quite... Uh, got to articulate as well as I could yet with the decision makers in Leeds, I want to have a hopscotch court on our civic square. Why do I want a hopscotch court on our civic square? Because then I'll know that we're allowing children to play in our city. Then I'll know that children are allowed to be there and giggle and shriek and have fun and make noise like the rest of us do. And sometimes we forget that going shopping is really boring. <laughs> I don't forget that. I still <laughs> shopping. It was a, a wonderful day. You know that question, when can your children go on the bus to town on the road as early as they can get away with it? Because <laughs> it means I don't have to go and pretend that I care. <laughs> But we're trying in Leeds to be child-friendly, to, to, to develop a, an attitude, a way of being, which allows our children to participate in and be part of our civic society, where they have access to decision-makers. I was interviewed by a panel of young people. I had two pieces of feedback. They thought that I was nice, and they said, would I be Father Christmas? <laughs> but they had a voice in the appointment of all senior officers, including the Director of Children's Services in Leeds, and ever more shall be so, I hope. This is something that we need to develop, and not just do as a tokenistic thing. And there's a risk of tokenism, and I accept there's a risk of tokenism, but how do we change our, our city, how do we change our cities to be friendly? We have a children's mayor, Oliver. The new one's voted in every year. And Oliver is a great young man. He's 10. And he goes round and he looks up at all these really senior people and asks the most impertinent questions, and it's fantastic. And he's allowed to do so. It's really good fun. We work in partnerships across the city, and we're seeking to develop what we call clusters, local small geographical areas where we have multi-agency uh, partnerships to look at children's services and services to children and families. And there is a huge commitment by senior officers and elected members, local politicians, to this notion. And that is really important, in fact crucial, if we're going to move towards child friendliness. I suppose as an aside, I would say, isn't it a, a commentary on what we're talking about today, that we need to campaign for child friendliness? 
but there it is. We might need to. We're investing enormously on restorative practices. It's been mentioned already this morning, and I'll not uh, spend hours on it because I'm going to run out of time in a moment. But, but we have a, there's a long history. This is not a new concept. <coughs> and it's not, a, it's not simply a theory. I'm arguing, and I, and I argue, and I, and I want to argue today, that this is about a way of being, about a, a way of existing and communicating and thinking and it draws from a whole number of different theories. It uses the notion of circles, non-hierarchical meetings where everybody has a voice. Half the meeting rooms in the headquarters of Children's Services in Leeds now have no tables in them. They were shifted out one weekend, and instead we have to meet in circles. And jolly good it is too. And people, where do I put my pen or my pad or my glass of, put it on the floor? Or hold it? Or put it on your knee? Or don't take notes, talk to each other. This notion of conversation that Margaret Wheatley writes very interestingly about is really key if we're going to change the way we think and the way we be. And then uh, I've just uh, referenced the International Institute for Restorative Practice and Ted Wachtel's work here. Doing things with families, not to them or for them, or even not at all. Balances high support with high challenge. Getting that right is skillful, but getting it right really works. This isn't some sort of soft notion that we don't challenge families where things are going wrong. It isn't some soft notion that we'll just pat them on the head and say, we're here to come and support you. Sometimes we have to deliver hard messages. But those hard messages can be delivered supportively. And getting the words right, practicing the words, understanding that if we work with rather than two or four, or not at all, is the way that we can bring about change. And it's clearly linked, linked theory to outcomes. Family group conferences, uh, I need to move on. Uh, participatory model, um, we are, it's, a, it's a way of developing uh, restorative practice within families, it uses circles, and as, crucially it helps families find their own acceptable and safe solutions and making plans. And they really work. They really work, and we are seeing remarkable outcomes from our family group conferencing. I'm just going to move on from there because I'm going to uh, run out of time. Developing the workforce, we need to ensure that it's not just one sector, we train and develop all sorts of people to do family support. The best people placed in the best communities. Where there are language issues and different languages, Leeds has uh, something like 100 different languages spoken in the city, we need to make sure that we have appropriately trained people. We need a clearly stated and coherent value base which is based, in, form for, uh, in my argument, around restorative behaviours. But it has to be a moral and ideological position that is adopted and worked to as the stated value base. We have to invest in learning and training up to and including degree level. And don't cut CPD just because we're in a recession. And I would say, uh, and, and, and again this reflects my career, we need to make friends between the academic institutions and writing and research and practice. And we need to be friends with each other and borrow from each other and use each other's skills. It's a stated commitment in Leeds Children's Services that everything we do will be research informed. I want to, to do the best we can. I want our, our, our social workers, our family support workers, our teachers, our youth workers, our early years workers to know what 
the best is and do it. And just because I like this slide, we start with theory. We want to come to outcomes. We develop our values and our beliefs. We move into skills. Don't you like this? It's great. <laughs> you should be enormously impressed already. So for values, beliefs, you develop skills. And then you develop practice. <laughs> hey? That's woken you up after your lunch, hasn't it? But that works. And the cogs are working the right way round, by the way, I checked. But that works. Theory to outcomes. Let's develop that carefully. In conclusion, we've got to, we must, it's critical that we develop and we support and we defend family support, especially in times of austerity. Process, the positive evidence is powerful. The economic evidence is powerful and it's compelling. If we can develop a motivated, skilled, empowered workforce, we can revolutionise the lives of children and their families in our communities. And we need to have and continue to develop child and family-centred policies. Thanks very much.